Um, the next thing I want to do is actually talk about the bright spots. These are your 2024 bright spot schools for math growth in the District of Columbia. How did we identify these schools? For lower elementary, we don't have a state assessment, but we did gather MAP and iReady data from almost every charter and DC public school in the city. And these 10 schools had the highest rates of growth for economically disadvantaged students. And in one year, more than 18% of those students were, who were not on grade level became to be on grade level. They increased proficiency on grade level rates by 18% in one year last year. So we are going, I want to one, hold our applause until the end, but if you are at a school represented on this chart, I'm about to read them out, stand up and at the end, let's clap them. So your lower elementary school bright spots, Beers, Cleveland, Friendship Blow Pierce, Moton, Patterson, Payne, Stanton, Thomas, Walker Jones, and Whittier Elementary Schools. For upper elementary, middle, and high school, we do have state assessments. And I do appreciate and thank Aussie for providing us additional data. What these represent are schools that earn the most possible points for math growth on the new DC report card. Remember that new DC report card now emphasizes growth for our economically disadvantaged students who account for 40% of the possible score. Students with disabilities also count for a disproportionately high percentage of those points. So these schools had disproportionately high growth for economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities. And so for the upper elementary schools, that's Burroughs, DC Prep, Anacostia, Harmony, Kip DC Promise, Kip DC Spring, Saul Bacchus, Powell, Raymond, Stanton, and Whittier. Thank you for your hard work. Congratulations. In middle school, Center City Petworth, DC Prep Benning, DC Prep Edgewood, DC Scholars, Friendship Blow Pierce again, Friendship Ideal, Kip DC AIM, Lucky, Walker Jones, and Washington Global. Congratulations. In high school, this is the first time we've ever had math growth data ever presented to us. And part of that is because we never had tested prior to the pandemic ninth graders, right? So we weren't able to track sort of like their eighth to ninth grade, their ninth to 10th grade growth. Um, so because we are now assessing through 10th grade, we have high school growth, math growth, and reading growth in the city for the first time. And so I think it's great to recognize that some of these schools are not the schools that we typically think of. And so congratulations and thank you for all your hard work to Anacostia, Cardozo, Cesar Chavez, Dunbar, E.L. Haynes, Friendship Collegiate, Girls Global, Idea, Ron Brown, and Thurgood Marshall Academy. Collectively, on the state assessment, 23% of these kids improved at least one proficiency level. Right? We know that a lot of our kids, because of the pandemic, dropped multiple proficiency levels. And so it may not come across in terms of level four plus meeting or exceeding expectations or level three plus ex um, approaching meeting or exceeding expectations, but 23% of those kids improved at least one level at these schools. So again, thank you for all of your hard work. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dara Shaw, who is the research director who will tell you a little bit more about what these schools did. We were able to not talk to every last one of you, and I'm sorry about that. This is an accelerated timeline, um, but we will talk to you. And so she is gonna share what those Bright Spot schools do and then introduce a panel of the educators, award-winning educators from those Bright Spots. Dara, oh, uh, Dara, you will introduce yourself. Sorry about that. Sorry. 
Hi, everyone. Before I even introduce myself, I encourage you to open those bags. In that little box is a little fidget spinner thing. So if you're like me and you're a fidgeter, I really appreciate um, having something like that. So you don't have to do it right now. But just in case you're wondering what's in that little white box, it's a little fidget toy. Uh, so thank you again. Um, my name is Dara Shaw. I'm the research director of the DC Education Research Collaborative. Your research practitioner partnership hosted here at Urban Institute. I'm really especially excited to be a part of the Math Hub and a part of this work because not only am I a former high school math teacher, but I am a former DC high school math teacher. I taught math at Coolidge High School and um, really resonated with uh, hearing some of the discussion earlier about tying research and practice um, because as a current researcher and a former practitioner, that is exactly where um, my life lies. So you have in your um, packet the report on DC Math Bright Spots. You're gonna hear in a second um, from an amazing panel that's coming right after me. Um, we heard this morning about how these research best practices and what that could look like in a classroom. But what we're about to hear from our next panel is what that does look like in their classrooms. And so really bridging that gap between research and practice. You see a lot more of this in the report. Um, but I wanted to highlight some of the strategies, practices, what this actually looked like in the classroom for some of the schools that we talked to. Again, this is from the report, but these are the five bright spot strategies. Um, first, developing students' mathematical confidence. So what does that actually look like? And what did we hear from the educators in the schools that we talked to? What does this look like? Resoundingly, our educators told us that in order for students to be successful, they first need to feel capable of success that students need to feel emotionally and intellectually safe in order to learn. So Bright Spots told us that they celebrate success and they make space for mistakes without punitive consequences to making mistakes. And they never punish students for a lack of skill or preparation. Bright Spots told us that they believe everyone can be a math person with the right support and relevant material, which doesn't just mean grade level appropriate content. Um, one teacher told us that students don't come into their class saying, I'm going to learn math today. Um, but if they generally want to be in the classroom and if they feel safe and respected in that space, then they'll learn. And what does that look like? It looks like students seeing themselves in the content or in the teachers or in their school. They might not relate to a particular teacher or a particular lesson or see an immediate real world connection as we heard from our last panel. But our Bright Spots told us that if students feel welcome and like they have a trusting relationship with the educators and adults at their school, then they are open to learning. One teacher told us that every day is a success if a student learns something new or is excited about learning. And again, I think that really resonates with what we heard from our researchers and those tough questions about um, students who are profoundly behind grade level. Um, but our Bright Spots told us that they celebrate the success of students learning something new. The second strategy was maximizing effective instructional time. Again, we heard what that could look like here from some of our bright spots is what it does look like. Uh, teachers told us about different ways of supporting students with different levels of understanding so that everyone is able to learn the content of their courses. Some schools use intervention blocks, which you heard about. So students receive that grade level or course level content and additional support without one at the expense of the other. But intervention blocks, not the only way that teachers were using effective instructional time. Some focus on strategic placement of students, making sure that students are in the right course for, what, uh, for their skills, knowledge, and abilities. Uh, some talked about using departmentalization at the elementary level so that students are 
for the instructional time that they have for math in front of a teacher who is an expert in mathematical content and mathematical pedagogy. Uh, sc some schools talked about looping also because these bright spots recognize that effective instructional time is not just about the right amount of time, but also about the right instructor during that time. <clears throat> we heard about high quality instructional materials being um, one of the strategies. Here's what it looked like for our bright spot schools. Teachers told us that a curriculum was a necessary but not sufficient condition for student learning. Even the best curriculum is necessary but not entirely sufficient on its own condition for learning. Our bright spots do have curriculum and instructional materials that work for most students, but they also utilize resources that can fill in the gaps. And they told us that they have the autonomy and the time to plan their lessons and adapt those materials. Some fill the gaps with personalized learning or vetted tech platforms, but a common thread among all of the Bright Spot educators was that high quality instructional materials is not something that comes out of a box. It's not even something that comes out of 10 boxes. Instead, having a cohesive high quality instructional approach requires planning and resources. Teachers told us that they're they are given time, encouragement, and support to be flexible by their school or LEA. The fourth strategy that we highlighted and we heard about from our Bright Spot schools was holistic instruction that creates problem solvers. Teachers told us that they explicitly make time in all of their lessons for teaching and using content, concepts, and processes. What does this look like in practice? They give students a chance to flex all of their math, math muscles. They grade, students can grade themselves. They give students immediate feedback on assessments. They deconstruct errors. They embed self-checking activities in their work. They hold by... <laughs> My glasses are not working when this bright light is shining right in my face. Uh, embedding self-checking activities in, in their work by having them explain their problem-solving processes and by creating habits of mathematical discussion and by building the ability for students to resolve their own confusion. All of this sounds like good practice, but the bright spots that they talk to say that this is an explicit part of their lesson plans. This is not just something that happens over the course of them instructing content. Uh, one teacher told us specifically that successful students are independent thinkers with the ability to be a problem solver and the confidence to recognize themselves as a problem solver. It's not just about the technical skill that a student has, but also the vision of themselves as capable of being a problem solver. This is important to prepare students for what's next in their education and in their lives, to help them advocate for themselves, and to help them build the problem solving, critical thinking, and analysis skills that are so important to learning and life. Our Bright Spot teachers told us that anything less is shortchanging students. The final strategy was supporting teacher preparation and ongoing development. What does this look like in practice in the classroom in the schools? The teachers reported that their schools use not all at once, but some version of coaching or veteran teachers or team teaching. And they use that the, they use the or uh, paraprofessionals and they use them in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's to observe teacher practice and give feedback. Sometimes it's to actually do differentiated instruction for small groups. A coach does not mean somebody peeking through the little window on the door, in the door, but somebody who's actually in the classroom and an extra set, not just of eyes and ears, but of hands as well. Sometimes it's to maximize expertise. A coach can, for example, analyze student performance data 
for the teacher so that the teacher can then focus on instructional planning. One of our teachers told us, and this was probably my favorite quote from all of our interview sessions, and we did a lot of them, that you shouldn't have to be the LeBron James of teaching to have students who are successful in math. Teachers also emphasized the ways that they were continually renewing their own content knowledge and that their schools or LEAs gave them professional development time to do so. Some used time over the summer or they were able to self-select their professional development that was useful to them and their teams of math teachers during the school year. Of course, what I've told you is only the highlights of many, many interviews, a lot of what is um, in our Bright Spots report. And we had so many rich conversations with educators that are summarized in the report. But I'm so excited to bring up our next panel where we have three distinguished educators who can provide their actual on the ground perspective, not just summaries, but specifics, um, into how they utilize the strategies with success.